Word of God says in James, the end of chapter 6, beginning of chapter 7, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The re- you'll see the relevance of that verse as we look at what we're going to speak on. I'm going to speak on tonight. It's not a really prepared sermon, so you'll have to forgive that, but Giles always takes the burden, so we're just trying to share that a little bit. But um, let's, let's worship God in this first hymn, singing together, 23. Oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. to him. Our Heavenly Father, you are indeed beyond all praising. You are the mighty creating God. You have made us, you have made us wonderfully, fearfully. We are made in your image and yet we are so fallen. Yet you rejoice in your creation. You looked upon your creation when you made man and made this world and made this universe in that seven day, six days and then rested and looked upon all that you had made and said, it is good. And Lord, we, we thank you for the goodness which emanates from who you are. Even when you speak into this world, good things happen. And Lord, tonight as we gather in a way that we weren't expecting to, 
We pray that you would help us to worship you as we ought to do. We recognize that we can look into your word and your word is truth and you can sanctify us and you will sanctify us by your truth. And we pray you'll do that tonight, Lord. We pray that you will help us to, to understand your word, to, to see what you want to say to us. And not just, to, not just in this hour together, but Lord, that you would help us to take it to our homes, to our, uh, to our minds, to our hearts, and to dwell upon it and meditate upon it and think upon how we might be made more like you. We ask, Lord, that you would continually forgive us for our sins. They are many. This morning, when we were singing, even though one vile as I, these are truths which we know in our hearts. We are vile compared with you. We have said things and done things and we fail to say things and fail to do things which are beyond number, which we ought to have done. Lord, you never did so, and you don't do still. You are pure and perfect, holy and glorious in every way. And therefore we thank you that you've given us your word, that we might recognize our plight in this world, and that you might help us to recognize our great need of you our great need of prayer, our great need of communion with you, the living God, and our great need to trust in you for all things, knowing, Lord, that there is a day coming when all of us will not just hear of you through your word and believe in our hearts, but we will see you, and we will be brought to that day of judgment when all things will be known. The secrets of our hearts, every one of us, will be known and laid bare before you, and for those who are yours, they will be gathered into your kingdom. And for those who are not, those who have shunned you and turned away from you in those approaches that you have made constantly, they will be cast into an outer darkness. And they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And these are awesome things, Lord. And we do not like to think of them, but they are truths which you have spoken and we believe, and we therefore ask that you would bless us, and that you would help us to draw near to you tonight, that you would help us to draw near in our hearts to you, and that by the Holy Spirit you might draw near to us, and give us each, according to our different circumstances, some form of blessing, some instruction, some chastisement, some whatever it may be from your hand, you are good. And Lord, we look to you to help us. We do pray, O oh Lord, for the world in which we live. This world is dire. It is broken. It is filled with violence. It is filled with sadness and deceit and corruption and scams and all these things which men do one to another. And it breaks our hearts to look upon this world. But Lord, we pray you would show mercy even in these days, even in this year 2023, that it might be that you would break in upon men in the midst of the earthquakes and wars and famines and fightings which are going on throughout this globe. Oh Lord, we pray that you would speak and that you would speak salvation into the hearts of many. Save such as shall be saved. Oh Lord, we pray. Be with us this evening, we ask, and help us as we look to you, to the glory of your name. Amen. Excuse me, I have had a, a very sore throat, so it's just got a little better this afternoon, but I want him to, to, to read. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to, what I'm going to do. We... Leslie and I, well, there was a, a conference a week ago. Um, there was some went to the Connected Conference in Dewsbury, and Leslie and I went to um, a conference, a Daily Bread conference. You've heard of Daily Bread. You were used to, some of you still use it, read it. And there was a conference in Liverpool, and uh, we often try and go together. It was just a lovely day, and they often will speak, four sessions, and speak 
on a book or a person in the scriptures, in the Bible. And this year it was a man called Paul Baxendale. And he spoke, we'd not heard him before, he was a new fellow, it's usually Bill Crowder from the States. And, and so we went, but always hopeful that God's going to speak to you. And he, he took the whole book of Esther, and over four sessions, different people read the whole of the book. And it was an absolute blessing to read it. You think you know a book, and you, you know, I'm looking around, we'll, most of us will be very familiar with this book of Esther. Not all. Um, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing book which tells us so much, and it's a little, almost a, a microcosm of the world that we live in, and how God takes His people and uses them. So, just I, I'm not going to try to read every bit of it, but I am going to read some little sections of it, if you, if you will bear with me. So, if you turn to the book of Esther. Um, and I'll read this, this first little portion from chapter 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, Ethiopia for over, over 127 provinces. And in those days King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. And in that third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials, and servants, the powers and of Persia, and Media, the nobles, the princes, the provinces being before him. And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his majesty, excellent majesty, for many days, 180 days in all, when all these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan the citadel from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. I'm not going to read every bit of it, because I'm going to carry on. And it basically says that at that time, he, 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 he showed his wealth, and I'll carry on a little bit. It says, and there the white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen, purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver, and mosaic, on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, white and marble, black marble, and they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. And in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his house that they should do according to each man's pleasure. And his queen, Queen Vashti, also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. I'll, I'll see how I move on with some of these readings, but it, but it, it speaks of a place of great, vast wealth and power. And one of the things they did to display their power and wealth was to do things like this, you know, seven days feasting, 180 days in different places, vast, vast amounts of wealth. As, as um, Malcolm just put it, it wasn't without a bob or two. <laughs> and that's the world we live in today, isn't it? It's full of wealth and power and sex and everything else that goes with it because it goes on to then speak about bringing his queen before him in her crown a bit like what you'd see on the television if you looked at it today and the adverts come on for not that we'll ever have watched it but Love Island and all these it's, it's debauchery and it's this world it, we, we see it all around us and it's a reality of the world in which we live and it's heartbreaking to see it but it's nothing new under the sun. And these are the things that we're, we may try and consider for some of this. But I, as I'm not going to be able to read everything, I would say, any of us, if we get the chance to go through and read through this book of Esther again, even this week, you know, it's amazing what we find in this book. Um, but let's, 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 look, let's sing it again and, and have another hymn. I chose these hymns based on this God who is, who is altogether glorious, who made all things, and, and yet men 
treated this world and everything as if, as if they made it, they own it. So 106, 106, great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Just again to, to reiterate um, why Giles and I have stepped in today, um, that we must really pray for Ben. He would have been due to have travelled down. They had got this week planned to go down and visit Ron and the family, and but it was such a shock to them for Ron. And, and in the process of this, um, CPR and the rest of it there's quite likely going to be um, brain damage and we don't know whether Ron will survive and he's on ventilation, he's on sedation and we don't know how, how dire things are and sometimes God shows you the things that you must do we don't know, any one of us do we what a day is going to, what a day is going to bring to us but we must pray. We must pray for Ben and the family and the situation. And some of us have been there at times in the past when we've seen illnesses in our families and, and those who we love um, broken in with health, ill health and the rest. But let's, let's really pray for Ben. And let's really pray as well for, 
by Margaret Burr House in, um, in Kirkwood Hospice. Um, she's, she's having periods of real confusion and difficulty and the, the, the cancer's probably spread into parts of her brain at times. Sometimes she's lucid, sometimes she's not. We, because I had, a bad, had such a bad chest and cold, we weren't wanting to try and visit today, but um, we have had some contact from Alison and Joy. So let's really pray for them um, and for Christine as well and for others. Let's do that again. Lord, we do pray that you who control all things in your hand, you who holds the very breath in our bodies, you who, who, in whose hands our times are kept, we look to you. We look to you for those in our families who do not know you. We look to you for those of our own kin who are careless for their souls. We look to you for those of our neighbours, our workmates, those who we live amongst, who have no regard for the things of their souls, and yet the most precious gift any single one of us as human beings have is that gift of a never-dying soul. And the destiny of that soul is so important. And Lord, we pray, we pray that you would help us to have an urgency in prayer for those who are lost and perishing. And we thank you, Lord, that when we uh, turn from the things of this world and put our trust in you, you are with us, you will keep us, and you will complete that work which you have begun in us. And we thank you for those words, those simple words at the end of Matthew's Gospel, where he says, I am with you always. And what, a, what an utter privilege it is to know that you, the living God, are with us always. Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust you always, to draw near to you always. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be truly prayerful. That's one thing which will come out of this passage this evening. Our need to come before you truly in, in prayer and to draw near to you. Lord, we lift up especially at this time our pastor. We, we thank you that he was led of you to, to, to even lay aside this duty which was a, such a burden to him when he was due to be preaching today. But Lord, we believe it is right for him to have gone down to be with his family and to be with them all as at this very difficult time. We pray for Ron. We don't know. We have no updates since earlier on today of the situation. But with Ron on that uh, sedated and on a ventilator, and Lord, we pray that you, you only know his situation. But we pray that you would bring great comfort to the family. And as Ron's trust is in you, we pray that you would keep him and have your hand upon his soul and that you would take him into your presence in your time or recover him if it would please you. You are able to do all things and we'll look to you for them and for Ron and for Lucy and for the, the others in the family, that big family. Lord, we pray as well for Margaret Burhouse. We thank you for her. And we pray that you might keep her and keep her soul close to you and that you would give her that comfort and peace in her heart and soul, even though her body is failing. We ask, Lord, that you would give her that strength to look to you and that when it is pleasing in your sight, that you would, you would gather her to yourself. But, Lord, we pray for, for Alison and for John who also trust you, and we pray for Joy and for Graham, who, who have not placed their trust in you, that you would draw near to them, and that you would be with them as a family. And help us, Lord, as brothers and sisters, to lift them up before you, and to genuinely desire their best, and the, the best outcome, the outcome which you have designed, and you have purposed. Lord, we pray again for Christine. We ask that you'd have your hand upon her. And we, we long for that day again, Lord, when we'll see her in this place and we'll be able to worship 
side by side with her again. We pray that you would continue with her and heal her and bless her. And for others, Lord, who we don't need to mention or cannot mention, you know all those in our families who have great need at this time. We lift them before you and ask that your peace might be upon them. We pray for John as well as he's preaching away in Billinghay today. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with him and help him. And that you would give him a word in season. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help me even. Uh, not used to standing here, but Lord, I pray thee that you would bless the word spoken. And give us a word in season, even now, to the glory of your name. Amen. I'm going to do another little bit of, the, of reading here. I'm going to move down into Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2 and verse 16. Because um, though this king had great power, um, his wife, Queen Vashti, was not going to be used as a little toy to impress his guests. And she refused. And so she was demoted. And... The wisdom was given by these courtiers to say, go and, find, go and find somebody else. And it wasn't Esther's choice. She wasn't uh, on, a, on a job to go, like, on, on, like I said, on Love Island, to go and see if she was uh, pretty enough or bright enough or good-looking enough to be chosen by the king. They went out to choose and to go and seek out. It wasn't her doing, it was... It was the king's doing and those who ran for him. So it reads here, when all the competition for the most beautiful woman was done, it said, so Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, that is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and she became queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai, which is her uncle, who, for those who are not aware, Mordecai was her uncle who had brought her up when her mother and father had died. And he was looking after her and caring for her. And he was obviously very near when she was in the king's, king, king's uh, custody. So Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not yet revealed her kindred or her people just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed. And both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And after those things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set him his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them. But they told it to Haman, to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that, made, what made, that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. I'll do another little reading if we go down to chapter 4. 
chapter 4, verse 1. And when Mordecai learned all, because then, then Haman became so incensed in this hatred that he had, that he sought to lay forth a plan and put it before the king to get rid of all the Jews in the kingdom. And it was horrific. But Mordecai, sly as he was, did this. And then it reads, when Mordecai learned all that had happened when this decree had come to kill all the Jews, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. And he went out as far as the square in the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed, and she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and, took his, and take his sackcloth away from him. But he wouldn't accept them. Then Esther said, Call Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn why, what and why this was. She was unaware. And Mordecai told him, Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. And he also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go in to the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. So Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and, and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants... And the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Esther told them and Told them to answer, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Mordecai told them to return this message, and Esther told them to return this answer to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Then Mordecai sent, went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. And so it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favour in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter let's, let's sing again now let's sing our next hymn 100 and, 113 O oh, Father you are sovereign in all the worlds you made, your mighty word was spoken, and light and life obeyed. Thank you. 
title of the of the message which I'll, I'll, I'll use the same title of the of the conference day um, the unseen hand of God for most of us will know that in the book of Esther God's never mentioned he's never mentioned in it but in this book in every part and everything that is done in it the hand of God is active and though his hands not seen and though his word his name is not mentioned his fingerprints are on every little thing every little aspect of this show God's divine action and though King Ahasuerus thought he was in charge he was the most powerful man in his day at that moment and he had such wealth and enjoyed power over provinces the like we, well, if we want to get geographical, you would, wouldn't you, Malcolm? But, but it's vast. It's vast. And yet, he's not in control of anything. <laughs> and the fingerprint of God is on every aspect of this. And I think this, the, what so encouraged me about the word when we went there a week and a, a, week and a day ago was just to, to make you look back and trust afresh in the living God who made us. To trust him and to see and to re-see where his fingerprints are in our lives, in our circumstances, in our work, in our homes, in our illnesses, in our wellness. All of those things, his hand is there, it's seen. And though we live in a world which is more interested in power, it's more interested in wealth, it's more interested in the outward appearance, it's all more interested in flaunting sex and everything else in everywhere and direction. And ad every advert on the telly, everything billboard you pass these days, it's there. But in the midst of that people, that nation, there are a people... And they're not a perfect people. They're these Jews. They've been taken into captivity. Not because they were good, because of their sin. <laughs> they're a fallen people. They're a broken people. They're a sinful people. But they've been taken away from where they ought to be because of their sin. And they've been threaded into this nation. And there they are. But there's something about them which is different, which is... As I say, it doesn't even mention God's name. And yet they are God's people. They are a people who are in covenant with God. Who God has promised certain things to. That if you will look to me, if you will trust in me, then I will keep you. I will bless you. I'll be with you wherever you go. And there's this people in the midst of it. And it's, it's this, this whole book is, 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 is a picture, if you like, of a battle of two different cultures. The vast big culture of the world. The vast big culture of Ahasuerus. And the tiny little culture of a people of God. Who are living not for the world. Who are living for God. Who are living in relationship with God. 
as poorly as they were, as sinful as they were, yet God had set his hand upon them. And in this, when you're in cultures like that, when you're a small little tiny nation in the midst of a vast world of power and wealth and all the rest of it, flowing, going against the flow creates friction, doesn't it? It always creates friction. And we see in this book, time and again, friction. Where power and wealth and, and authority come against somebody who says, no, God's word says, I can't bow to you. <laughs> Just like Daniel and his, his three friends who wouldn't bow to the golden image. And, and it's no different. But in this little book, it's, it's there, it's clear, but it's, it's unusual. But because of this friction, we live, if we're truly God's people, we are always going to be rubbing up against the world. We are going to have to take a stand. We're going to have to go against the flow. We're going to have to say, so far and no more. We won't go along with the lurid jokes. We won't watch the things that others would think is good to watch and fun to watch. We won't go the places that others would go. But we can do what that first verse I read was. We can live humbly before God. And the whole, this whole book encourages me to just think again. It's encouraged me to really, to really see myself in my life and to think how I might more closely walk with God. Because where there's friction, it creates heat. It creates problems. And where friction arises, we don't have to be the ones who sort it out. If we're against the flow... The wonderful thing is God's in control of all these things. He's in control of all these things. But there were three things that when you read through the whole of the book, which, which weren't necessarily his points when, it, when, when we were there at this conference, but they were the things that struck me. That, that this prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, the key issue for us. And then the second point was providential actions of God, trusting in the providence of God. He's active when he doesn't need us to do anything. <laughs> he doesn't need us to do anything. He can do it all himself, but he asks us to trust him and to watch this space, if you like. Trust him and let him do the rest. But at the end of it, there's an awesome thing, and I may read it towards the end, and that is the judgment of God. But at the end of the book, the judgment of God is clear. The judgment of God against individuals in this, in this passage, or maybe some of these key characters, it, it, it shows it's just the same in the world today as it was back then. When people of God stick to the truth, stick to Jesus, live for him, people oppose Sometimes they'll mock, but sometimes it's more than mockery. Sometimes it's hatred, a visible, tangible hatred for the things of God. And in this, the third point in this is, is this judgment of God. But alongside that judgment, there's a joy. <laughs> At the end of it all, those who have opposed God are judged. But those who God has delivered... Rejoice. And it's just like heaven. You know, at the end of the day, when it's all over and done with, when the Lord returns, we'll be rejoicing for eternity. But there isn't a lot of rejoicing in this world right now. But there are these, these, these key characters, and, and, and I'm not going to speak a lot about it all, but the key characters in it are this King Ahasuerus, is first Queen, Queen Vashti, then Queen Esther, who she becomes, um, and taken, her uncle, Mordecai, and then there is this man, Haman. Now, we, we read that little passage where, where whilst Mordecai is sitting there waiting, sitting there waiting to see what's happened to his, to his niece, whether she's safe, 
how things are going, is she okay? And he's in the king's gate just outside the, the palace and he overhears two doorkeepers and he overhears that, that they're actually plotting to, they, they, they've got some dispute with him and they want to take all and kill him. He's only a man after all. But he overhears it, he passes on the message to Esther and, and then there it is. Um, she passes it on to the king and Teresh and Bigtha <coughs> gone but then he's forgotten <laughs> so it was a bit like that with Joseph wasn't he when he was in prison he, he's soon forgotten he knows how to read dreams and somebody forgets they forget well here here the next the very next verse after, after Haman's recognised Haman's recognised and, and saved the king's life. The very next thing, the very next thing is that some unknown name up till now, Haman, who's high up in the king's court, is, is made to be like prime minister, second in command to, the, to King Ahasuerus. Gives him his signet ring and he's powerful over all these things. But this man is so filled with, with hatred simply because... Mordecai, this Jew, won't bow down to him. Just because he won't bow down to him and pay homage to him, he doesn't, it says, it says if you read it fully, it says he wouldn't lay a hand on him directly. Worse than that, he's going to plot and plan to destroy all of the Jews. And he, he buys the king off with this promise of paying for this and that and the other. You know, you think, where, where does this sort of venom and hatred come from? Where does it come from? We're looking in the society in which we live. And it's, it's often tiny little seeds, but they grow up into something that are destructive and beyond any measure of understanding why they should be like they are. I, was a, 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 I never go on so many conferences, but I was at a dental conference just yesterday in Manchester and was speaking to somebody at one, one of the stands and, and, and she, she, what did she say? She said something like, oh yes, um, we're, so long as we're all singing on the same hymn sheet and she said, oh my, my daughter said to me, oh you can't say that now. That's, it's, you, you're not allowed to say that now. You're not allowed to say we're all singing on the same hymn sheet. <laughs> I'm thinking, but you know, these these things start small, don't they? The the thing is, this world despises everything Christ-centered, everything religious. It's despised. It's hated, and what starts as something small spreads out into every part of society, every part of our culture, so that even young folks say, "Oh, you can't say that," because it, it speaks of religion speaks of Christianity it's the same thing here it started as something small but it grew to something vast but what it what it did bring out was this prayer and fasting and I'll say in prayer and fasting which we see in Esther um, I'll, I'll put it this way we need prayer and fasting in times of extremity and in times of prosperity. Now, it was times of extremity for Mordecai. All his people were going to be killed. For Queen Esther, <laughs> she was living it okay. You know what I mean? It was quite nice. She, she was being waited upon by everybody. She was, she was the king's queen. And, and yet... For both Mordecai and for Esther, they came to realize with those few words between them, who can know? You know, don't, don't think you'll survive. If all the Jews get killed, they'll find you eventually. You'll be killed eventually. But the, the thing is, Jesus said, Jesus said, how can my people, when, when some Oh, the disciples of John and the Pharisees came to him. They, they, they said to him, why don't, why don't your disciples fast? 
And he said simply, now why would the, the followers of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom's there? <laughs> but when the bridegroom has gone, then my disciples will fast. And Jesus, it's, it's still the same. It's a biblical principle, is fasting. It's not something, it's not dieting, it's not this, that, and the other. And, and it, it's, a, it's something where you make yourself physically weak, in a sense, in order to get spiritually close to God. And I think we, we don't, it's not something that we do, it's not something that we teach, but it's there in the scriptures. And I believe it's a really important thing. It's one of those things that helps us to draw near to God and helps God to be heard in our tiny little minds and to draw near to us. And one thing that is powerful here, which is also seen in this passage which we've read, is that united prayer, whether it's in times of extremity or prosperity, united prayer brings united blessings we too often pray for something small in, in our life, my life, can, you know, or an individual. Or, you know, those are good things to pray for. But united prayer in these type of situations, when the church, I mean, look at us, how many pew sp spaces are on these pews? And yet how full are the pubs? It's, a, it's stunning how, how weak the church is. It's a time of extremity for us as a church. And we need to get this message. We need to take strength and learn from the word of God where we need to be. And prayer and fasting is the only answer. It's the only answer for us. It's the only answer for us as a church. It's the only answer for us as individual souls. It's the only answer. And, and it's not to be, I'm not being extremist. It's just something we need to get hold of if we're going to get close to God, if we're going to be in God's will and live for God, we need, we need to draw near and we need to consider times of fasting and prayer like Esther and Mordecai and all the Jews throughout all the provinces. The message got out and they all got about that business. And it was, a, it was a dangerous thing that Esther had to do. Very dangerous. I didn't realise this, but this, this chap Paul pointed out that in the British Museum they have, they have um, stone images of these kings like Ahasuerus. And on, on one side he would have the scepter. They would have the scepter. But on the other side of the throne there was the axe. So it wasn't like... Uh, Oh yeah, he's just sitting there with a nice golden scepter. It's not like something in Parliament. You know, one side's the scepter, the other side's the axe. The king says, what are you doing here? I had enough trouble with my last queen, Vashti. What do you think turning up here? The axe comes out. So, it's not a little thing. It wasn't a little thing. She wasn't wrong to say, if I perish, I perish. She wasn't saying, I can't do it. But she says, if I'm going to do it, please, give yourself to prayer and fasting for three days. It's not a long time, is it? We take a long weekend. Do we take a long weekend for God? to deal with some of the things in our lives, our work, our families. Prayer and fasting. But trusting in the providences of God. And, and we, see this, this, we see this right the way through. And, and God didn't need help to sort this situation out. He even, he even sort of brought Haman into the, into the place in the first place. Um... Mordecai was the one who should have been praised and lifted up because he just saved the king's life. But this Haman appears from nowhere and becomes prime minister and he's doing whatever he likes, seeking to kill all the Jews and the king just signs it off. But God was in control of everything. 
And sometimes we think we need to be in control of everything. And sometimes we need to, we need to stop fighting against God by doing the things that we think are going to get us where we want to be or where God think, we think God wants us to be. Sometimes we have to trust God is in control and get do business with God in prayer and fasting so that we can then step back and see God work. Now, as I say, we can't read every passage, every part of this book, but I would urge everyone to, to really read through this book because it's amazing. Because from, from the day that Queen Esther came in and the king took, it said she found grace and favor in his sight and he held out the golden scepter and she came and touched her hand onto the tip of that scepter and was accepted and it pleased the king. And she didn't say, all right, well, would you get rid of Haman for me? <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't a matter of a simple request. She stepped back and let God do the work. And she was wise. And God gave a wise understanding mind and heart. Because then she said, if it pleases, because he, he was offering her, you can have anything up to half the kingdom if you read it through. And she said, what, can I have this half? No. <laughs> she said, would you come to a banquet? I'm going to do a banquet for you. Would, would you and Haman, the prime minister, come to a banquet in my house? So there she did. And, and that first banquet when they went, and Haman was thinking, whoa, I'm in here. Ah, whoa, the, the queen has invited me alongside the king. But that wasn't, you know, God was in all of this. But he, 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 she didn't give him an answer on the first banquet. She said, would you come a second night? Would you come for a second banquet? But there's God working away in the background. The king's thinking all of these things. What's going on here? <laughs> but that night the king couldn't sleep. The king couldn't sleep. And it says the king, as you hear us, could not sleep. And God's got his, his fingers on his eyelids. <laughs> he couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep in here. He couldn't sleep in here. And he said to his people, bring the books, bring the books and read them to me. And so all of a sudden he said, they read it out and it was recorded there about Mordecai having, having um, saved the king's life. And he says, well, what, what have we done for him? What have we done for him? How, how have we honoured him? And he, he, by the time he got into his palace the next morning, who pops through the door but Haman, and Haman says, Ooh. And, and the king's mind still focused on how we, how, we, how we deal with this man who saved my life. And Mordecai's coming in thinking, oh, sorry, Haman's coming in thinking, um, Oh, he's, he's, he wants to honor me because the king's saying, what, what would we do to the person who the king would like to honor? What should we do for them? And, and Haman's thinking, well, what would I like done to me? Well, I tell you what, the horse, the king's robes, the this, that, and the other, and then get somebody high in the kingdom to ride in front of the horse saying, this is what the king will do to those who he desires to honor. And Haman said, yes, yes, yes. But no, he says, well, go and get Mordecai and do to him all that I've just told you. All that you've just suggested, go and do it. Whoa. God's in all of this. But this, these are answers. These are providential answers in God's hands to how God is dealing with this whole situation. And between the banquets there, who could have done it? You know, Esther wasn't there. She couldn't keep him awake. God did it. God did it. He, he even devised all the other things, if you, if you look through in detail. When, when, when Haman was thinking, when can we get rid of these Jews? They cast the lot. They cast the lot and, and Haman took the, the lot and it fell on a day that was... Passover day. Amazing. So the day of deliverance 
Haman's set up has been the day he's going to destroy them all. It's just amazing how God intervenes. And it does say in, the, in Proverbs, doesn't it? The, the casting of the lots, God's in the outcome of it. I'm not quoting it word for word there, but the thing is, for all this hatred, I mean, we, we've seen it throughout the book. First, the, the, the king Ahasuerus was full of anger at Queen Vashti, and then Haman's full of anger and venom against, against Mordecai and the Jews, and yet God's in the middle of all of this. And it's, it's something we've got to just to learn to do, isn't it? To trust God. He deals with the tiny, minute details all the way around. And it's just, th this book is just, is just full of that. It's full of it. But then at the end, there's, there's a judgment scene comes across, which I shan't re read because it's, I, I, I've spoken too long already now. But it, 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 it's simply spoken in, in, in the end of, towards the end of chapter 6 when, when Haman, having had to um, take Mordecai on this horse all round the streets of Shushan, the citadel, proclaiming before him that he's more honoured than the king, and he goes home with his head covered and is in total shame, thinking, what's going on? What's going on? And then he goes home and his wife says to him, when Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And Haman had already planned how he was going to get rid of Mordecai. He'd set up a gallows to hang Mordecai on. Because he wasn't just happy, he wanted, he wanted to be done in his land. But then... All of this, God intervenes and turns it around. And it's quite wonderful. Even desperate days like we live in, from a Christian point of view, God can turn it around. But only if we trust him. Only if we really want him to. And only if we're willing to seek him. I mean, fasting and prayer. And trusting in his providence to intervene for us. But just that last point of, of, of judgment and joy... At the end of it, he, he goes to that second banquet. I'm, as I say, I'm trying to share some of these things. Most of us are familiar with him. He goes back to that second banquet. And the king says, look, come on now. What is it you want to, to half the kingdom? Just tell me. And Esther says, I want the life. I want my life and the life of my people given to me. This wicked Haman has plotted to kill all the Jews. And she's not told the king she's a Jew till this moment. And here it is revealed. And the king, again, is filled with anger. And, oof, and he's, he's outside in the palace garden to try and control himself. It's that bad. And then he comes back in and Haman, Haman's begging at Esther's feet. Saying, please, you know what's going to happen. Don't let it happen. But as soon as the king comes back in and sees Haman almost molesting his wife, that's it. They put the bag over his head. And within minutes, within minutes, they're saying, did you know that he's actually set up a, a gallows? He set up a gallows to hang Mordecai on. Go and hang him on it. Go and hang him on his own gallows. You know, pride is one of the most awful things that we, fee we see, we find in ourselves. It's hard sometimes to look in the mirror when we see it there. But isn't it time sometimes to swallow our pride? Because when you see it in people like this, it's, it's this, you know, what, what about being hung on your own gallows? You plan all these things. But God's in control of everything. And one other thing he despised, he despised it in Satan, a chosen angel who was set aside and he fell from 
glory with a third of the angels with him because of his pride because of the pride in his heart because he elevated himself up above God which all of these did but God is able to humble the proud he's able to do it but we don't do it ourselves we can't do it ourselves we need to swallow our pride sometimes but there was also alongside that judgment when Haman when Haman was hung on his own gallows and within days all his ten sons were destroyed, were killed by the Jews and they set up a whole new, a reverse edict so that all the Jews could go and destroy those who were trying to destroy them. And the ten sons of Hamadatha, it says, the ten sons of Hamadatha were killed and all the people relating to Haman's family got rid of. And it's a, it is, at the end of it, there was a, there was a festival of Pur, a festival of, which was, is a festival of, of the lot, if you like, which is what it calls it. I don't understand all of that bit, but the thing is there was rejoicing. There was rejoicing because God once again delivered his people. He used normal little people, a young Jewish virgin, an old Jewish man, to pray, to call on God, to seek God's face, and the people of God were delivered. You could read back to front in this book, and it's happened time and time and time again. And Jesus has come for us all that we might escape that same judgment because this is just a little picture of the big reality. And it's about time we all recognised who's in control. And for God's people, we need to think about praying and fasting. We need to think about taking prayer really seriously. We need to trust and watch for him to work. And let him do his work, his way. And we need to be looking always to that eternal judgment day. That eternal vindication. And we also need to think about those who are outside the kingdom. Because there was a king once, Nebuchadnezzar. And he was so arrogant, he had to eat grass. And have his nails grow like a cow. Like, like a, a beast of the field. But he said after he was brought to see who God is, who Jesus is. Well, he wasn't at that moment. He was brought to understand. And he was humbled. And he was saved. And he became, though he was a great king, he became a, king, a child of the kingdom of God. And that's our desire isn't it, as a church. Our business is to tell people about this wonderful saviour that we have who's delivered in the past, who will deliver now, who's delivering us now and he'll deliver us in the future. That we might help people and guide people and lead people to take Jesus at his word. When he says, you know, that some people, I never knew you. I never knew you. We were never in relationship. We don't want to get to that point where we see God, we see Jesus face to face and we were never in a real relationship with him. We want to swallow our pride. We want to see people genuinely, prayerfully humble themselves before God. And as Jesus put it himself, fall upon the rock and be broken. Don't wait till that day when the rock falls upon you and you'll be crushed. Because today's a gospel day. It's a day of opportunity. It's a day when we can seek God. When we can put away the sham. And when we can cast ourselves upon the mercy of God in his son Jesus Christ. And when we can fall upon him. And you know when you fall on that rock? You just want to keep hugging him. <laughs> because though he's a rock, 
He's the right rock. He's a rock of compassion. He's a, he's a saviour beyond understanding. He's a saviour who saves to the uttermost. And he'll save anyone who calls upon his name. So, let's pray. Let's set ourselves to pray aright. Let's trust in God. And watch his providences. And watch his interventions all around us. And let's fall upon this Jesus afresh. Let's cast our hearts and souls upon him. And let's not end up like Haman. Let's not end up like Haman. They, they, used, they used a lot of different versions when they were reading. And one of them didn't say gallows. It said like a spike. You know, what, what, you know, what a terrible thought. To be impaled on the spike that you'd set up to kill others on. You know? I can't get the image out of my head really. I didn't want to share it earlier. But what about that? You think you're there and then you get impaled on your own spike. On your own plans of destroying others. We don't want to be there, do we? Let's be Esther's and Mordecai's. And not Haman's. And not has you weird us either because we don't hear anything of him turning. Let's have our closing hymn. 79. 79. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. The, dark, <coughs> the darkness falls at thy behest. To thee our morning hymns ascended. Thy praise shall sanctify our rest. 79. shall never, like earth's proud empires, pass away. 
Thy kingdom stands and grows forever till all thy creatures own thy sway. Lord, help us to own the way you have provided, to own Jesus Christ, your Son, to own up to our sin, to own up to our failings, and to cast ourselves upon you. We thank you that you are a merciful God. We pray that you would take us to our homes, to our beds this night with your word in our hearts and a prayerful heart and soul. And may we, Lord, be desiring always to draw near to you and desiring that you would draw near to us. Forgive anything spoken amiss, I pray thee, and bless that which is pleasing to thee. And may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of us, now and always. Amen.